Why don't we get into business first? Because we've spoken so much this morning on policy, and I know people want to hear you know, your, your take on this because you've been uh, very active and, and engaged and, um, and supportive uh, of, of a lot of folks uh, through fundraisers, through meetings, through, you know, you're, you're a leader uh, in kind of the intersection of crypto and, and, and policy. So we're going to get into that. But I think a lot of people also want to hear about your role in the Bitcoin ETF. Maybe we can get into a little bit, whatever you can share about FTX. Everybody wants to hear your, your, your thoughts on macro. So I'm going to do dealer's choice. Do you want to start on the policy stuff or do you want to start on the business stuff? What are you more sick of talking about? Let's start with the ETF. <laughs> that's like the, it's the hope right now. When I think of crypto, like think, I'm building a, a pond in my backyard. Uh, it's a big pond. And every day, there's evaporation from the sun, right? The water evaporates a little bit, the wind and the sun. In crypto, that's our salaries, this conference, mining fees, right? So crypto evaporates every day. We need fiat to, to pay for all this stuff. And so at the bottom of the pond, there are pipes that go in, right? And up until 2021, we had Binance and Coinbase and FTX and BlockFi and Voyager in tons and tons of pipes that were pumping water into the crypto pond. Right? Total crypto market cap is only that, that pond. You know, because of fraud, because of bad actors, because of 5.5% interest rates, a lot of those pipes got cut off, broken, and a lot of the existing pipes just have a trickle coming in. And that's why our market cap is just kind of hovering. And so the ETF is really by far the best chance to re-inject a lot of water into the pond. Uh, I actually think, unless we get a government shutdown, which is a probability, uh, we're gonna get good news in October, uh, which I don't think is consensus. Uh, and that would mean you probably have an ETF actually trading by early December. Um, I don't think people understand how important it is. And so, you know, Invesco, who's our partner in this, uh, we wanna win, right? But Kathy Wood wants to win, BlackRock wants to win, Fidelity wants to win. There are probably seven or eight credible competitors that I think will launch the same day. And so if you step back, while we want to win, we also want Bitcoin to go higher. And think of the, the sales forces. You've got BlackRock sales force, Invesco sales force, you know, ARC sales force, Fidelity sales force. So you have an entire new group of people picking up the phone, because Bitcoin is always sold, it's never bought. One thing I learned starting in 2013 when I had to explain what the damn Byzantine generals problem was to people to kind of get them to buy Bitcoin. Uh, now it's a macro asset. And so I think this is a complete game changer. Uh, prices are always set on the margin, right? They're not a lot of sellers. Right now they're not a lot of buyers or sellers, right? We have very low liquidity in these markets. Um, but you're gonna start seeing buyers and they're not gonna buy and sell right away. So you're gonna suck up a lot of supply and prices are gonna go a lot higher. That's the US situation. Is that the same narrative that is kind of in the background globally when you're thinking about macro? Listen, Bitcoin always has two levers to it. It's got a macro policy lever and it's got adoption. So the macro policy lever is pretty simple. We went from 7,000 to 69,000 when every central bank in the world said we're going to print as much money as necessary to get us out of this pandemic, right? When we had fiscal policy uh, as expansionary as any other time since World War II. Like, it was supposed to go up. If Bitcoin didn't go up, I would have jumped off a goddamn bridge. Uh, it was supposed to go down when Chairman Powell said, I'm going to raise rates from zero to five and a half percent, right? At its core, Bitcoin is a macro asset. It also is early enough in its life that adoption is really important. And so I think adoption will outweigh the macro, but we're going to get this adoption boom. And the next move of the Federal Reserve will be a cut, not a hike. They said, well, we're going to hike one more time. They're not going to hike one more time. They'll cut rates. They won't cut them right away. And so it's not until they actually start cutting rates and then having to cut aggressively that we're going to see the, the, the macro kick in. And so for the rest of the world, they're going to take their direction from price, mm -hmm. right? The one thing about crypto that anyone who's been around learns is when price goes higher, people get excited and price goes higher, right? 
So you, you've got this correlation uh, of good news bringing in good news. And so. I think, I think if we um, zoom out 12 months prior when we had the last uh, mainnet, people were feeling relatively optimistic then, right? Even though the, the rates were rising, people were optimistic, maybe you know, we'll get an ETF, it's gonna be a little bit of slog. Um, and I think the one thing, I, agree, I happen to agree with you, so we don't, we don't wanna, and I assume a lot of people here are bullish, right? Or they wouldn't be at this conference, but um, one thing that has not come up, at least on any of the sessions that I've, I've done yet, is remaining black swan risk. R remaining black swan risk for the industry, right? FTX drew a monkey wrench on a lot of the goodwill that we had, a lot of the market structure improvements that we had, and a spot Bitcoin ETF, its approval would be a step in the right direction. I think it helps kind of globally, not just in the US. Are you still concerned that these overseas exchanges that are in the news for all the wrong reasons are still this kind of looming sort of Damocles hanging over market structure in the US? And if, if so, um, how do we get around that during this period of uncertainty. So listen, if, if I was just a Bitcoin bucket shop, I'd sleep like a baby right now, <laughs> right? Bitcoin has already established itself with regulators and with people as a macro asset. So it's just a question of time that we get more and more adoption. But like Coinbase, Galaxy is building prime brokerage and research. We need lots of tokens for our business plan to be worth a shit. Like, if there are only two stocks to trade, Goldman Sachs ain't doing well. So if it's just Bitcoin and Ethereum and some stable coins, I'm shit out of luck. Uh, and what the overseas exchange did, and did brilliantly, right, is they created easy UX UI access for tons of people who wanted to gamble, right? I used to call them Macau 2.0. Uh, we were gambling on these new ecosystems that had a story. Prices got way ahead of themselves, right? Oh, this blockchain's gonna dominate the world. It's the 93rd blockchain that's been launched in two years, right? So if it was Arbitrum or Solana or Polkadot, they had communities, they had smart technology, they had people building them, and they had market caps that got wild because of this gambling phenomena. Those casinos will not be shut down completely, but they've been kneecapped right now by regulators and by these 5% rates. And so we need them, quite frankly. The, the, the ecosystem needs them because what the whole concept of raising money through tokens, launching tokens, it was venture capital to these new projects. And it was a lot of frickin' venture capital to these new projects that allow things to build. If you had asked me and if I was the czar, I'd say, oh, we don't need 100 blockchains, maybe let's start with 10. But I wasn't the czar, right? People had ideas and they thought they could make a whole lot of money and they add to, the, to this giant pool of block space that we're building. And so I go to bed and pray, like the best thing that could happen for the space other than the ETF right now is that Binance and CZ settles with the Department of Justice and gets a clean bale of health and goes back to work. Uh, we need those on-ramps for fiat into crypto and we need that leverage. Right, what, the, what the space is missing right now is leverage. Right? We're trying to build this prime uh, and we're getting there. But for it to really work, we need leverage. Yeah. We need to be able to borrow money. And the cost of capital for companies right now in crypto is really freaking high. One of our mutual friends uh, likes to say that every single legitimate financial industry needs to pay a billion dollar fine before it's considered credible. So I sure hope I don't have to. <laughs> yeah, hopefully it's not Galaxy for, for, for your shake. And by the way, I can, I can already see that we're not a Bitcoin bucket shop being taken out of context by the Bitcoin media and maxis. Mike Novogratz admits Galaxy is a shitcoin bucket shop. So, um, but on that, on that point, I don't know uh, how much you can talk about the FTX situation, but I do think there's some misconceptions in the relationship that you have with the creditors that chose Galaxy to kind of help facilitate some of the uh, settling up of accounts, uh, if you will. There's an impression that Galaxy is just gonna hit the market sell button and like dump the price of Solana to, you know, three cents. But like, can you just explain like logistically from a market structure standpoint, like what, what this relationship looks like, why it is good for the industry? Sure, listen, first of all, we're proud to get that mandate. Uh, I give my asset management group a whole lot of 
a lot of credit. Um, we're a fiduciary, so we can't really talk about what their positions are, or what they're going to do with them. But I would frame it this way. In a typical bankruptcy, the judge appoints a liquidator, and he takes their assets and he sells them. And he consults with the creditors committee. Who do you think have had debts or had credit with FTX? Crypto people. How many bearish crypto people have you ever met? Very few. Uh, and so you got a creditors committee who most likely is bullish because they believe in this stuff. And so unlike what would be a normal, the end run bankruptcy where you're liquidating assets, there's a belief system, I think, that there's a lot of value in that portfolio. And between our advisory and working with the team, they're going to try to maximize the value. And so if you ask, you know, the broad thoughts is it's, no one's going to dump a ton of assets on the market just to get rid of them. Or they already would have, right? We had an amazing rally that before Galaxy was involved, they could have sold all their tokens into. Yep. So Occam's razor tells me that if they didn't, there's probably a bigger plan. All right, this is a good segue into the good stuff. So we're doing a lot of cleanup for things that predominantly have happened offshore. And despite that, there's still obstruction. I would, I would take, it, I would take uh, umbrage to that. Okay. We had Voyager and BlockFi and Celsius. Canadian. They were all oh. onshore, and they all went tits up. So I don't think Celsius was onshore. Alex Mashinsky lives like two miles from me in Amagansett. Oh, well, get him out. <laughs> okay. All right. I stand, I stand corrected on, on his, uh, his, his personal residence based on uh, where he was able to... At least, you, at least you were able to afford that place legally. But um, I think... Um, the, the, the general point is, I think a lot of the collateral damage has to do with the offshoring, the regulatory arbitrage, and then yet we have the situation where the SEC is still obstinate when it comes to the Bitcoin ETF. They're still obstinate and pursuing folks uh, like Coinbase. And when you're having some of these uh, conversations on the policy side, you know, do you ever just bang your head against the wall or, you know, what, what, what is, like, how do we, how do we get past so, this? Like, you know, I've process? said a lot of smart yeah. things since I got involved in Bitcoin in 2013 and I've said a bunch of dumb things too. I think the, the biggest, the worst prediction I made. Uh, I think this, you, you should get a tattoo of Elizabeth Warren, by the way, because that would no, solve no, listen, everything. Listen, when Gary Gensler <laughs> took over the SEC, people asked me all the time, I'd worked with Gary Gensler at Goldman Sachs. I taught his class at MIT. I know him very well. What kind of SEC chair he'd be, and I thought he was going to be very good for crypto. And that was probably the single worst prediction I ever made. Um, when I look back at it now, Gary Gensler f feels like he got his job, and he is, in and he is uh, indebted in lots of ways to Elizabeth Warren, who's a very good friend of his. Elizabeth Warren, for reasons I literally can't figure out and can't get a meeting with, just really doesn't like our space. And so choke point 2.0 is some combination of Elizabeth Warren who made a deal with Biden for Biden to get elected when she dropped out that she would have final say over people on the financial side of his cabinet. And so the regulatory regime of the Biden administration has a really heavy hand from Elizabeth Warren and she hates crypto. I have met with her chief of staff he said in 13 years, her ex-chief of staff, in 13 years, it was the only issue he disagreed with her on, and she's just not changing her mind. And so in a lot of ways, Gensler won't be there in 2025, even if the Democrats win again. You know, we're, we're waiting out the clock. Um, thank goodness the courts have, you know, knocked them outside the head a few times. Um, I don't think the next head of the SEC will want to take these cases further on. Think about it, we have a Supreme Court that would like nothing more than to take the regulatory powers away from government. Right? We have a really conservative Supreme Court right now. We have a court system that, you know, it's a little bit of potluck. It looks like Coinbase got a great judge. You know, praise God. Uh, uh, Ripple won a case that a lot of us thought they wouldn't win, and then they lost the case. You know, you, it's a little bit of potluck on what judge you get. Yep. But the next head of the SEC is not going to roll the dice. So all these lawsuits that you're seeing, 
they're not going to see the light of day. It, it takes two, three years, right? Gensler's got 15 months left. Mm -hmm. And so nothing's going to change until the election. The chance of legislation getting done in D.C. is close to zero. I'm going to D.C. next week. I'm meeting senators and congressmen. Brian Armstrong's going to be there. A bunch of us are showing up. We're telling the story. We're trying to use, you know, the, the Bitcoin, and the crypto community to say, hey, we can get behind you or we can get in front of you, right? None of that really is going to matter in the short run. It'll matter a lot in the medium to long run. I'm not spilling state secrets here because you can look at the FEC database. You're a lifetime Democrat, I think. You've been a big supporter. You've been generous. And, and the, the reason I'm bringing that up is you said, I can't get a meeting with some of these folks. Like, have you seen since FTX, have you seen more of a chill on conversations or is Elizabeth Warren really an isolated I, I, I have had lunch with the... Uh, Without naming names, but, you know. You know, with, with the most senior people in the Democratic Party in D.C. And they were really honest. They were like, dude... You guys gave us Sam, and he turned out to be the biggest fraudster of all time, and we all look like idiots, and so it just is going to take time. Yeah. It's too soon, and that was three months ago. I literally think we need more time between making an ass of ourselves where our representative turned out to be a fraud, and we didn't vote for him. He showed up, he took the space, and people were letting him do the work. Some, uh, of, us, some of us worked against him behind the scenes, but... And, you know, that's just the reality of politics, right? Maxine Waters was hugely pro-crypto. When that, when the um, stablecoin bill was, looked like it was going to get passed out of nowhere, the White House called Maxine and said, vote no. Maxine voted no. Hold on, she was our advocate. That's the way Washington works. And so we got to rebuild momentum. We got a, I'm actually having my first Republican fundraiser in my life in a month. That's news. For Tom Emmer. Anyone who wants to come, I got a great house. You're, you're welcome. Uh, Tom Emmer has been a He's also one of the most likable people in D.C. So. And he's a good friend of my uncle's from Minnesota. And, and listen, he's done wonderful things for crypto. He's holding the SEC in check. Um, I do think we've got to give to our champions, Right. Guys like Richie Torres, who's apparently come here to speak, mm -hmm. likes crypto. Uh, Jake Auchincloss, if you're from Massachusetts, smart as hell, kind of centrist Democrat, loves crypto. Um, Senator Gillibrand will be here in Senator a Senator Gillibrand is a big fan of crypto. And so you also have to remember that congressmen and senators have a lot on their plate. Most of them don't even know what fractional banking is. They're like, eh? And so... They don't need to know everything. You got to get the people on the right committees. You got to get the people that care about your issue. And if you can get 15 champions and they have clout amongst the rest of their colleagues, you can get a movement going. We got a minute left. Uh, hopefully next year, we're not talking quite as much about DC politics, but if the market returns to new heights, if we end up seeing a, a sea change in momentum, if we have clear regulations by this time next year. What are the three things that happened that we got right to actually move the needle in that direction? Well, listen, so break crypto into four buckets for a second. Like I said, Bitcoin, we should sleep like babies. It's already won. We can take a victory lap. Bitcoin is now a macro asset. Jeff Yoss, the richest man in Pennsylvania, loves Bitcoin. Abby Johnson, the richest woman in Massachusetts, loves Bitcoin. Like from the the biggest and most influential and wealthiest people around the country and the world to tons and tons of investors, it's already been litigated in one that it's a macro asset. Now it's just adoption. And so you can check that box. And on the other side, stable coins, right? Stable coins, every country in the world is either working on a stable coin or a CBDC. Uh, adoption overseas is growing really quickly, right? So if it's Tether on Tron, pretty much. Justin Sun told me he made $400 million a year just running validators for Tron. I love that guy. What a business. Uh, but you think about what that means. It means that most people who are sending small amounts of money uh, for efficiency's sake, because it would cost them so much to use the traditional systems, they don't really care how decentralized the, the blockchain is. They're looking for efficiency and price. 
right? And so we're going to have this whole panoply of chains and systems that allow people to pick how they transfer their money. And so that part of the business, I feel really confident, check the box, it's going to grow. Then the next two boxes, right, there's tokenization of other assets. Every bank, Citibank, every asset manager is getting involved. Apollo, Goldman Sachs have not tens of people, hundreds of people working on this tokenization. So far, total tokenization, anyone want to guess? $400 million. It's a drop in the bucket, right? It hasn't happened. We're, we're working on some of it. Is it two years? Is it three years? I don't know. It most likely will happen in the future. The reason we all got into crypto, though, or most of us other than Bitcoin, was this idea of this decentralized revolution that we were going to, first on Ethereum and then on other blockchains, build this shared database, right? This giant Microsoft Excel spreadsheet that no one could control, uh, right? Block space. And on top of it, you were going to see all these wonderful things built. And at that part, we have failed. Uh, pull out your phone. Does anyone have one app that they're using to do something, you know, buying tickets on a blockchain, right? Doing Uber on a blockchain. And so what we need to see, and I haven't given up. I'm just calling a spade a spade. We're not where we thought we'd be. The blockchains themselves are getting faster, right? Ethereum is a much better product today than it was a year ago. It'll be a much better product in a year. Uh, but in 2017 and then 2021, we were given the benefit of the doubt because you had this mania, this big idea. That's what bubbles are created for. And now you're going to need to see something work. Show me the goddamn money, right? And so that's what we're looking at. We've invested in over 250, you know, protocols and companies. Some are struggling. Some are doing better. But the crypto community has to have a reason besides Bitcoin and stable coins for businesses like mine to matter, for Coinbase to have a success, you know. Because if we were sitting here in four years and we were just a casino, you'd be like, that's an okay business, but it's not really it why. feel great. Crypto pulls some of the most talented kids in the world into our space. Even today, I'm shocked at who I'm hiring. With all the crappy headlines, with the tiny volumes and exchanges. Like, it feels like you're walking through a mud forest running a crypto business. Like, oh, every step. Um, yet, we continue to pull in unbelievable talent. And that's because people see this as a purpose-driven revolution. And that's where the focus of this whole community needs to be, building stuff that works. That last bit could have been a keynote in and of itself. So uh, it's a perfect place to end, Mike. Thank you so much for joining us.